Good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to open this summer school on uh, cyber and computer security in the area of, uh, it's a long name, what was it? Cryptocurrencies and something and blockchains and decentralized. Uh, it should be somewhere. Uh, we will meet in the next five days. Uh, the first three days will be held here in this Churchill Auditorium. The last two days will be held in electrical engineering in the Kogan Auditorium, which is slightly smaller. Uh, I'm Professor Eli Biam. I'm now the head of the Cybersecurity Research Center named after Hiroshi Fujiwara, our donor from Japan. Uh, of course, he's one of the people who made this event possible. The Cyber Center is in cooperation with the State of Israel Prime Minister's Office, the Cy National Cyber Bureau, who also provide us with resources and uh, help us in organizing this event. This cyber center is uh, coordinating research in various areas yes, in, of cyber security. Uh, you see here this area of cryptocurrencies, but also in others such as Oh, the list is quite, quite big, so I'll not list everything, but of course, uh, secure software, uh, cloud computing, security of cloud computing, security of robotics, security of various other systems, uh, computerized systems, IoT. Uh, personally, I have many works in cryptography and cryptanalysis. Uh, what else? Of course, security of networking, security of many other things. I not list everything here. And we have many researchers. The members of the center, we have currently over 60 members, faculty members from around the Technion, uh, from computer science department mainly, also mainly from electrical engineering and industrial engineering and management. But we have members from other departments as well, such as aerospace engineering and others. The center funds research in the Technion, research money for research work, publications, and so on. The center funds fellowships for graduate students in various areas of cybersecurity. And, and, and the center hosts various events. Probably this is one of our largest events, uh, the Summer School on Computer Security. You see this event now. But we also have an annual crypto day, a one-day event in areas of uh, cryptography. It's an annual cyber day, a one-day event in various areas of cybersecurity. Uh, we cooperate with the light, Lightweight Crypto Day with the University of Haifa, or Dunkelman, who organized this is somewhere in the audience. Uh, and next year's conference, the main conference, one of the main conferences in my field, Eurocrypt, will be held in Israel. And uh, we are also organizing this together with Ordun Kelman, when I mentioned already. Um, so this is the center. And we have many events. Probably we will have more. And you are all welcome. You are now in our mailing list. So just feel free to get our announcements and uh, join our events. Before we continue, I wish to have uh, several announcements. Uh, one of them, 
We have a gala dinner, if I'm not wrong on Tuesday evening. In order to join the gala dinner, you are requested to go to the registration desks outside in the break and tell them that you, you want to register uh, in order that we will know how many people are coming. So please don't forget, uh, we want to know how many people are coming and you'll probably get some tickets to, to come to enter. Uh, I also want to thank our various uh, sponsors. You see here a partial list of sponsors. Uh, Ethereum is, uh, I should have coordinated it uh, with a slide, so I'll read it from my list, not to, fit, not to forget anything. So uh, Ethereum and Zcash and Singularity Team and Protocols Lab, Protocol Labs are our platinum sponsors. Tezos is our gold sponsor, uh, Bitmain, eToro, Zen Protocol are our silver, silver sponsors, Haifa Municipality is also sponsoring us, and we are doing everything in cooperation with, of course, the Technion, not only the Cyber Center, but the Technion also have other supports for our mission. Uh, it's also in cooperation with the International Association for Cryptologic Research, the IACR. Uh, it's also in cooperation with the Israel Bitcoin Association and in cooperation, of course, with the National Cyber Directorate in the Prime Minister's Office. So I want to thank all those list of sponsors for making this event possible. Thank you for all the sponsors. Now, what else do you want to know about the, the center? So probably you don't. Uh, probably you want to, to hear what we have in this event. So you have a, a list of topics and uh, talks today, but this part will be made by Eli Ben Sasson. So I invite Professor Eli Ben Sasson to speak. So welcome everybody and thanks uh, uh, Professor Biam for the uh, introduction and for organizing this uh, wonderful event. I'm very excited about it. I didn't sleep very well last night. Um, but uh, okay. So I'll give a very brief introduction for those who are not aware enough of things like cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And let me start by asking um, who here, please raise your hand if you know what blockchain is and have even offered an explanation to your mom or spouse or something. So please raise your hand, I wanna see how many. Okay, so I'll probably um, bore some of you or most of you, but for those who haven't heard, I'll give a very brief introduction and which doesn't really capture everything. So um, money started as some limited physical resource like gold or seashells. And today, most of the currencies we use are fiat. In Latin, it means it shall be. So it's money made by decision, uh, usually of some central trusted party, like a central bank. And um, cryptocurrencies do it differently. There's no centralized party that dictates how many coins there are or should be. And the way supply of coins is limited is us among many, many peers in a decentralized network, but there's no central trusted party. And that's a big difference. So um, I think one of the, I, over the years that I've been following Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, I've had a number of these eureka moments where you sort of say, ah, okay, now I understand something that I didn't about things like Bitcoin. And, you know, as scientists, these eurekas are the things that really we, we seek and, and crave. So one, one of these Eurekas, I'm sure others have noticed it before uh, and independently, so you know, it's like solving a question that others have solved. It's not, it doesn't matter if others got it first, but once you see it, it sort of is very pleasant. So one of these Eurekas is that 
what is Bitcoin? So there's blockchain and there's uh, mining and there are hash functions and crypto and a lot of stuff. But I think um, that's not the essence of the innovation about Bitcoin. The essence of the innovation is what's written here. It's the first time a societal function, something that everyone needs and, and counts on, um, the societal function that we thought needs a central party to run, suddenly, thanks to Bitcoin, we realize that that is not necessarily the case. You can replace it by some combination of algorithms and protocols. And for Bitcoin, that societal function that was displayed to be amenable to decentralization is money, which is a very basic thing that human societies invent all over and every time whether they are secluded in prisons or on islands or, or in schools or whether they are big communities. Um, and this immediately raises the question, okay, so what next? There are a lot of other societal functions that right now require central parties to run, um, law, government, academia, religion. And you could ask, okay, so now what? May, maybe they could be, or parts of them could be decentralized. And I think that's a really innovative, um, question or, or possibility that, that Bitcoin proved to be possible. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, the way I came to be involved in cryptocurrencies and, and love them is that um, a long time ago, I was doing research on something very, very theoretical. I think I heard at least, from, I think, uh, okay, I heard it first from Vitalik describing these things as moon math. So I was interested in something called uh, probabilistically checkable proofs, making them efficient. It was all about math and theorems. Um, then at some point we noticed these things enough to actually try and implement them. And we started implementing them um, around 2008 was the first time I got involved in it. Um, with no real known app, it was sort of a, it's a cool thing, let's try to do with it something. I don't know what it's good for, but... Uh, um, and then another eureka moment I had many years later, I mean, I heard of things like Bitcoin, but it never sort of uh, caught on, was as we were looking for possible applications for this thing that was starting to be more, um, you know, to actually work, um, sort of dawned on us that the kind of things that we and others in the world are doing are very well suited for cryptocurrencies. And that was another eureka moment, that the proofs that look very theoretical or had no applications were actually needed and useful in, in things like Bitcoin. Um, and that led later on to a paper, an academic paper called Zero Cash uh, with my co-authors, Lissandro Chiesa, right now at Berkeley, Christina Garman, um, graduating from John Hopkins, Professor Matt Green, also from John Hopkins, uh, Ian Myers, uh, graduating from John Hopkins, Ran Tromer from Tel Aviv University and Madal Zvirza from MIT. And we sort of jointly wrote a paper about how you can use some of these proofs for um, achieving better privacy and fungibility. This later on led to Zcash, uh, the founder of which is uh, Zuko Wilcox. Uh, he's also the CEO and he's also here. And you'll hear more about these particular things um, later on in the week, especially on Tuesday. Um, so now, for those who haven't heard at all or know very little about Bitcoin and blockchain, I'm just going to do the speakers later on. Some of them asked me to say something about it. So here's a very brief, informal, you know, five-minute um, introduction about Bitcoin. So in the end, bit, but I'll say Bitcoin, but all other respectable cryptocurrencies, you could replace Bitcoin. For, uh, sorry, you could replace them for Bitcoin and it would be the same description. So a cryptocurrency is essentially defined, and I'm, of course, simplifying a lot. So, but a cryptocurrency is, at the end of the day, defined by a program. And usually these programs are open source, so you can see the code, and then you can download, you compile it, and you can run it, okay? Now, if you run it, and you are connected to the internet, um, you will, or your computer will be joining a vast network of nodes, and anyone can join as a node. You can do it now, here, if you have the internet connected. And what your node will be doing is something like this. It will be listening for new transactions, where transactions are payments, you know, Alice pays Bob. And then your node will be trying to take a bunch of valid transactions. I mean, no one's printing new money or playing foul games, a double spend. So you check each transaction, 
it's valid. I mean, your program will do that. And find a bunch of them and pack them and call this thing a block. So now I have a bunch of transactions. And now you have your block and you can start competing with other nodes out there in the network in this game of trying to push your pack of nodes, this thing called a block, onto the blockchain. And the blockchain, which is a term you hear a lot, is essentially just the emerging sequence of, of blocks. And each block is a bunch of transactions that correspond to some economic activity. Okay? So that's the game. So again, you download software. The software lets you play this game. And you could immediately ask, what's your incentive to participate? Why should you waste your time and, and electricity on doing this thing? And the answer is that the way the protocol or the program is set up for Bitcoin and most, <clears throat> most other cryptocurrencies is that you get a reward for helping out. So the Bitcoin core program, the protocol, says that you are supposed to accept um, one mining transaction per block, meaning one bunch of coins can be mined out of thin air in each block that is added to the blockchain. And currently, the mining transaction is a reward is 12.5 Bitcoins, which uh, I checked last night. That was about $53,000. You know, things are very volatile, especially these days with uh, what's going on. Okay, so um, now you also get, as one of these nodes, you also get paid transaction fees from others who want their transactions on the blockchain. So you can make a, a good sum of money by um, succeeding to add your block of transactions onto the blockchain. Good, so now everyone would want $53,000 uh, for a block. So how do you get your block into the blockchain or onto the blockchain? Um, so there are three simple rules. Uh, thou shalt not bear false witness, so you should only include valid transactions. What it means is that the program checks blocks for validity of transactions. So in particular, if you try to cheat and um, you know, double your mining transaction reward, you are risking this block not being accepted because that's not valid by the rules. And the same thing with double spends or other illegal transactions. So if you want your block onto the blockchain, you better not cheat and follow the rules. You're incentivized to do that. You should uh, respect thy predecessors, which means you give a, a reference and honor to the previous, to the latest uh, block in the blockchain. And otherwise, again, you, you, uh, Paul says that you should go with the longest chain, and we'll hear a lot about whether there are other rules that could replace this and what's the difference between them. And the last thing is you have to be smart, which means your computer has to be the first to solve some cryptographic riddle. The last slide on introduction to Bitcoin. Um, which crypto riddle? Again, we'll hear a lot about that. There are many options and advantages and disadvantages to different kinds. Some of the main things you want is uh, your riddle, the riddle that you need to solve, should be tied to specific blocks. So you can't just work for a year and solve a riddle and then get to put any block you want. It has to be timely and related to a block that you're trying to add. It has to be pretty hard to solve because there's a lot of competition and we don't want uh, everyone adding an infinite number of blocks immediately. So, you know, we need one solution about every 10 minutes. So you need the, prob the riddle that's going to be solved to be hard. But you also need it to be easy to verify so that on my smartphone I can check that this block is valid or something like that. And the most uh, mystical and hard to achieve aspect is you would like it to be some kind of a democratic riddle where everyone can join easily and the, the, the game is sort of leveled. And, um, and this, this is pretty hard to achieve and it's a discussion whether it's debatable whether it has been achieved in any cryptocurrency. But that's at least what Satoshi Nakamoto wanted. And we'll hear a lot more about the way the riddles play uh, and, and how consensus is reached about the blockchain tomorrow. So I just want to summarize. Bitcoin and other currencies are defined by open source programs and the proliferation of, of cryptocurrencies. I know there are more than a thousand listed um, on various websites and all the time there are more and more. So this is because they are mostly defined by open source programs. So, so there, there's this invitation to innovate and change and, and do new ones. Um, these cryptocurrencies are all in the end of the day executed voluntarily 
by anonymous nodes worldwide. They're very open, or sometimes this is called permissionless, so you can all download your favorite software and start using it. And the nodes compete using things like electricity and hardware um, to extend a blockchain. And the nodes that are competing, if they succeed, they are rewarded by, by money, things that are worth money. And that's why they want to play this game. So there's this competition going on between nodes. And as a result of this, there's this beautiful emergent property of a blockchain or a payment ledger that is stable, doesn't change much, it's lively, it keeps getting new transactions, it's immutable, you can't rewrite history and, and get your money back, and it's valid, meaning the transactions don't make money in illegal ways or ways that are deemed illegal by the protocol. And because of this, it's an empirical fact that users and, and customers around the world are assigning economic value to many of these coins, and that's right now a fact. Now, who knows what will happen? It could all drop down to zero or jump to infinity. We don't know, but at least the concept that this societal function, which is money, has been, at least for some period of time, been decentralized or offered an alternative that is decentralized is really amazingly innovative and powerful. So I want to give an overview of this, um, this, this week, this summer school. Um, I guess the main thing we try to achieve, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of uh, meetups and, and, and conferences about blockchains. Um, this one, we wanted to move it as far as we could to the um, academic, technological, core ideas side of things, rather than here's my latest uh, you know, blockchain or startup and I want to tell you about it. So let me just give you an overview of what's going to go on starting with today. So right after I finish, we're going to talk about, uh, so the transactions I described basically were just of the kind Alice paid Bob, you know, some money. But actually you can extend them to, uh, to, to do much more elaborate things and contracts. And that's going to be the first topic of our, of our workshop. And this thing has been pushed to the limits by Ethereum. So the first set of talks is going to talk about smart contracts in Ethereum. Then we're also going to talk about network theory. So all of, uh, all of these blockchains ultimately reside on the internet. And the structure and the way the internet works implies a lot of things about the security and stability of all the cryptocurrencies on them. So that's going to be the second topic for today. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the topic that perhaps attracted the most uh, discussion within um, academic and, and, and uh, entrepreneur circles, which is the question of uh, the blockchain and how do you reach consensus? What are the consensus mechanisms? Are they safe? Should you replace them by other things? What are their properties? And so on and so forth. How do you address scalability as more and more transactions come on the blockchain? That's going to be the topic of tomorrow. Then on Tuesday, we're going to talk about, the main topic is going to be about adding privacy to various decentralized networks. And um, this is going to be a, a, this is an interesting challenge. And um, a main theme here is going to be the use of things called zero knowledge proofs, which are uh, cryptographic uh, inventions uh, um, whose basics have been laid uh, some, something like 30 years ago, starting with fabulous work by uh, Shafi Goldwasser, uh, Silvia Mikali, and uh, Charlie Rakoff. They received numerous prizes for this innovation, uh, including Goldwasser and Mikali received the 2012 Turing Award for it. So we'll hear a little bit about how these things are applied to get better privacy. That's going to be Tuesday. Now, on Wednesday, we're going to move to the regulatory and legal aspects of blockchains and have uh, legal experts uh, um, from Israel and from, from the US discussing what's going on in the regulatory sphere and how are regulators thinking about uh, what these things are in terms of uh, things like ICOs, initial coin offerings, how do you regulate these things, uh, what about crime related to them, all of these issues are going to be discussed on Wednesday. And on Thursday, we're going to focus down on uh, the Israeli scene a little bit more and also on, I mean, on two themes. One is going to be governance. How do you deal with governance in a decentralized um, blockchain? It's a very um, 
serious and intriguing issue that's also being confronted today in, in all cryptocurrencies, most notably in, in Bitcoin, uh, regarding the scaling uh, question, um, but also in other blockchains. And we'll also hear about uh, interesting um, startups going on in Israel, just a, just a few of them. I and mean, there are many, many very interesting startups, so we'll hear like a couple of talks from two established ones, and um, that's the plan. So I just want to end this thing by thanking the Hiroshi Fujiwara Cybersecurity Center um, for basically organizing every aspect of this thing. And uh, especially Professor Eli Biham, the, the head of the, um, of the center, and Ms. Susie Eid, who is, uh, who is the director and has been working very, very hard with the assistance of uh, Ms. Adi Hoffman. So I really want to thank them all. Um, so now we're a little bit, I think, ahead of time, but that's uh, good. Uh, I want to introduce uh, our first speaker, and that's going to be Professor uh, Joe Bono, who just started as an assistant professor um, at uh, NYU, like just this month. And he um, actually is flying out tomorrow to teach another class, I believe. Um, so it's really, really great to have him here. And uh, so Joe Bono, I can't go over the list of all the things he did because he's really um, been in a lot of different places that all of them are related to uh, understanding cryptocurrencies. So he worked with Google and Yahoo and Microsoft. He also interned at the FBI. And he also worked in academic uh, endeavors like the Electronic Frontier Foundation at Princeton. And, uh, sorry, uh, no, that's not in Princeton. At the Center for Information Technology Policy in Princeton, he did a postdoc with Professor Dan Bonnet in Stanford. And um, he may or may not at some point uh, um, be a science fiction writer. Who knows? Um, so I'd like to commit him to writing a, a science fiction book, but uh, we'll see if he... he I mean, he's planning to do that, so let this be a commitment to that. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Joe Bonneau.